you please uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10? If you'd like to follow along in the reading of the Word. I mentioned last week that um, we, we dwelt a little bit more time on that um, particular topic of humility in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> we looked at that parable that wasn't included in Mark, not only to enlarge on that particular topic, but also to spare this text for this morning because it fits in so well with our um, purpose for this morning's service, which is dealing with another excuse of why a person, perhaps one of you, doesn't want to trust Jesus and follow him. <coughs> this one happens to be one of the greatest, and that is fear. Let's read the text, just a few verses, Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, I've already mentioned to you several times, and as we've been going through this series, we see that it is true that people have many objections to becoming a Christian. And we've seen some of those objections. I mean, there are those who simply do not believe that what the Bible says is true. And if they don't believe that, of course, that obstacle needs to be overcome before they'll ever come to Christ. But there are many people who do believe that what the Bible says is true, and yet they still don't come. And that for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't want to live the kind of life that Jesus calls us to live. I mean, they have to give up their sin. They love their sin too much. Or maybe they have a misconception of what is actually acceptable to God. And they think, like the rich young ruler, I've done enough. I mean, I've done what you command from the time I was a child to the present. That God's going to accept me the way that I am. I don't need Jesus Christ. Or maybe they're not willing to pay the price that the Lord calls us to pay. Which, he says, you have to be willing to give up all your possessions. You have to be willing to do whatever I call you to do. You have to be willing to confess me before men. Maybe they don't want to do that. And along those lines... Perhaps the problem is what we're looking at this morning. One of the reasons that ranks, I would imagine, up at the top, and we know that, even as believers we know that, because it's something we have to contend with, and that is fear. Fear of many different things. Fear of perhaps uh, making waves in our relationships. Fear of not being accepted, not being in the in-group, of losing friends people that we've known for years, or even family members. We just read in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said that if you follow me, you're going to find that some of your enemies are going to be the members of your own household. Maybe it's a fear of being hated by other people, hated to the point where you would even suffer. I mean, there are those in different places of the world who profess the name of Jesus Christ, and for it, they are killed now, we haven't had to face too much of that in the United States, but I would venture to say that if you do follow the Lord and do what he says, that is a distinct possibility even here. Now, Jesus does say in his word that if you follow him, you will be hated by the world. That is the price that you must be willing to pay if you're going to follow him. Now, this is something the disciples were very much aware of they knew the cost, and they didn't know it just theoretically. I mean, Jesus said this was the case, but they actually experienced it. They know, or they knew what it was. And they knew what was waiting for them in Jerusalem. Even before Jesus said this, this wasn't the first time he said it. And when they saw him going up to Jerusalem, they knew what was waiting. 
They knew that Jesus, their master, would be delivered over to the religious leaders. They knew that they would condemn him to death, hand him over to the Romans to be crucified. They knew what the Romans were going to do to those who were handed over to them as criminals, that they would go through the ceremonial mocking and spitting, that they would scourge him, and that they would crucify him and kill him. And they also knew what that meant for them. If they're going to treat Jesus like this, same thing's going to happen to us. Jesus told them earlier in John 15, verses 18 through 19. Actually, this would be later, but it's nonetheless true. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, <clears throat> but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Now, are there things to be afraid of if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there something that there is to, to fear? Well, of course there is. Things that are potentially there, things that are a temptation to you not to follow Jesus because they're there. But have you considered what you would have to fear if you don't follow Jesus? Maybe if you would take a good look at those things, you wouldn't be so afraid of the things that are there for following Jesus. You know, I believe Jesus uh, was doing the very same thing in Matthew chapter 10 as he was equipping his disciples to go out. He says, don't fear those who can kill your body. But fear the one who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. Now, why did Jesus say that? It didn't exactly feel like a nice warm stroke. I don't feel so terribly encouraged after hearing that. God can destroy me in hell. Well, he did that to put their fear in perspective because one fear can cure another fear. And I believe that that is one of the things we need to consider if we're going to overcome the fear of men overcoming the fear of what somebody might do to us. Now this morning, I want us to consider three things from this text. The first is, what do you have to fear if you follow Jesus? What are those things? Secondly, what you have to fear if you don't follow Jesus? Again, perhaps the one fear will cure the other. And how the Lord basically tells you, you can live without fear, which is something I imagine all of us want to do. It is possible. Jesus himself lived that kind of life. Well, first of all, what do you have to fear if you follow Jesus? Well, I've already told you there's many things that could potentially make you afraid if you follow him. I mean, the person who ever said, and I've heard people say this before, I mean, this is, this is something that happens. If you come to Jesus Christ, all your troubles are going to be over. Again, the person who said that had no idea what it means to follow Jesus Christ because that is not true. When you trust in Jesus, that's when the troubles oftentimes begin. If you trust Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and you really live the kind of life he calls you to live, you will have difficulties. You're not only going to have difficulties in your own heart as you seek to do what God calls you to do and you find it's not as easy as you thought because you don't want to do it as strongly as you thought. You find that you've got a big struggle going on in yourself that's one of the difficulties. But the other difficulty comes from others, and that's the hardest struggle we have to overcome within ourselves is to deal with that difficulty. Because you may not only lose some of your most cherished family members and friends following Jesus, sadly, you may even have to struggle with people in the church who will hate you for doing what Jesus calls you to do. As a matter of fact, that may be the case in majority of churches in this United States. It happens even within the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and that shouldn't surprise us because sin, every church has to deal with sin. Following Jesus is not easy. It means becoming what the people of this world hate. It means doing what the people of this world hate. I mean, Jesus does turn your darkness to light. He turns you from loving and doing the wrong things that the people of the world love to do and love to say to loving and doing what they actually hate. 
I mean, there is a real struggle between two kingdoms here. There is darkness, there is light, and those who are in the kingdom of darkness do not love the light, and they don't like what's going on in the light, and they don't like the children of the light. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. You realize Jesus is talking here not about just a group of people who lived in his day. He's talking about everyone in the world today who is in the kingdom of darkness, and that includes everyone who is not a true believer. They are in that kingdom, and they hate the light, and because of that, they will hate you. And so you will find yourself often, if not always, on the opposite side of the fence with other people on just about every issue, whether it be religion or politics, those things that we love to talk about, you will find yourself on the other side of the fence. And because of that, you will not be able to get close to them, and they're not going to want to get close to you. You'll discover that what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 is, in fact, true. And I think we would do well to pay attention to this. It reminds us that we cannot... It's impossible to have a close friendship with someone who is in the world for these very reasons. What partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? You know, relationships are based upon what you have in common. And yet Paul is telling us that we have nothing in common with an unbeliever. The Lord has not called us to make them our friends. He has not called us to make them our bosom buddies. He certainly has not called us to marry them, but he has called us to reach out to them in love with the gospel in the hopes they might be saved and brought into his kingdom. But the fact is, as long as we're in the light and they're in the darkness, we're not going to get along. We're going to love them, but they're not going to love us in return. They are going to hate us. If you live the life that Jesus calls you to live, you're going to find yourself in the same situation with people who actually claim to be Christians. I mean, there are so few believers today, quote unquote, who really, really have an interest in doing what Jesus tells us to do. And the reason is they're still in the darkness and they hate the light. And for that reason, they're going to hate you. Now, the disciples were following Jesus, who was on his way to Jerusalem to die. Because the spiritual leaders of Israel, the leaders of Israel, who were the people of God, hated him. And hating him, the disciples knew that they were going to be hated as well. The vast majority of the world and the church... The vast majority of the church, sadly, which is the reason why our country is in the condition that it's in, are just as these leaders. They hate the light. So are there things that you could potentially be afraid of if you trust and follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course there are, because you're going to turn the majority of the world against you if you do that, and you will ha be hated by all, as Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out on the road to preach the gospel. And again, I don't think he meant that just for them, just because he was sending them out. He meant that for everyone who would follow him. So that's one thing we could potentially be afraid of. Now, secondly, what do you have to fear if you don't follow Jesus? You know, again, one cure can, or one fear can cure the other. Now, as we move to the second point, I would venture to say that most people are going to stop as they think about what it will cost to follow Jesus. They're going to stop right there, and they're not going to go any further with Jesus because they are not willing to pay the price. Maybe you're not willing to pay this price. And if you're not, it may be because you can't see far enough down the road to realize that there is much more to be afraid of of the path that you're on than on the other path that Jesus actually calls you to walk on. I mean, it's true, there is a fearful price to pay for following Jesus. 
But there is a much greater price to pay if you do not follow Jesus. Much more to be afraid of. If you avoid Jesus and remain the friend of the world, the Bible says you also remain at the same time the enemy of God. Now again, you might say, wait a minute, the enemy of God? I thought God loves everyone and has a wonderful plan for their life. I thought God will answer the prayers of everyone even if, they, even, if, even if we hate him, even if we never listen to him, even if we do the things that he hates all the time. Isn't it true that if anyone just calls out to the Lord, he's going to help them because God loves all people? Well, many believe this to be true. I mean, you've seen the bumper stickers, smile, God loves you, and so forth. But haven't you ever asked yourself the question, if God loves everybody in this way, even those who don't obey him, then why does he cast people into hell when they die? If he loves them so much, why does he punish them so severely? Just because their time happens to be up in this world. Well, the reason is because God doesn't love them in the sense that many people think that he loves them. As a matter of fact, the people of the world who have not trusted in his son are God's enemies. James writes this in James 4, verse 4. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? If you're going to be a friend of the world, you're hostile toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Does God have enemies? He's got plenty of enemies. But you not only make yourself his, you're not only an enemy yourself of him, he is your enemy as well. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 5, verses 4 through 6. This is a verse that doesn't compute in the minds of many people because they have this conception of God's universal love of all mankind. Now, certainly God offers his love to all. And I do believe he sincerely offers his gospel to all and tells them to come. And if they will receive his son, they, then he will love them. He will love everyone who receives his son. But if they don't receive his son, if they reject his son, then they remain in this kind of a state where they are the enemies of God. And this is what God thinks of them. David writes this, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. God hates those, the, the psalmist says. David says, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel, King David, the one with whom God made his covenant, that he would bring his son through him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, says God hates those who do iniquity if you make yourself a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. Now, certainly, there are things that could make you afraid if you follow Jesus. You could lose family members and friends you care about, friends you enjoy. They could turn against you along with the world, and you could be hated by everyone. But the question you need to ask yourself is this. Would you rather be hated by men or by God? Now, whether you realize it or not, you depend upon God for a number of things. I don't think you want God to be your enemy. You certainly don't want him to continue to be. God is the one, after all, for whom or upon whom you depend for your very life and existence. Every time your heart beats, it's because God allows it to do that. It's his will. Every breath of air that you breathe comes from him, along with every mouthful of food and every stitch of clothing that you wear every friend, every family member you have. God is the one who is responsible for giving you every comfort that you have in life. He's the one who has provided the work that you have. He is the one who has given you the health that you have, the money that you have to enjoy. Every good thing, every good gift bestowed comes from God. He is also the one who says that he will cast those who have done what is wrong in to hell forever, who don't repent of their sins and turn away from them. He is the one who has the right to determine where you are going to spend the rest of your eternity. Now, these are all the things that God does, 
the things that he does for you. This is his authority. He has this power. And the question really you need to ask yourself is this. Do you really want to choose a path that will make you the enemy of God? I mean, you're already on that path. Do you really want to continue to walk on that path? Do you really want to choose the same path the majority of the people of the world are walking on when the Lord tells you that in the end it's going to lead you straight into hell? You realize that hell is God's wrath being poured out through all eternity, his hatred of sin, his judgment. That's what hell is. It's not just a compartment somewhere that God just doesn't pay attention to who's going down this, this road. I mean, it is a place where God positively judges those who will not turn from their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus told those who had gathered around along with his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Do you think anybody goes to hell? Jesus says, many go to hell. The road is broad. The majority of the world is walking on it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, which path is really more dangerous for you? The path that the Lord calls you to walk on or the path that you are already on, the path that the majority of the world is on? Is it better to be afraid of men or is it better to fear God? Now, Jesus said to his disciples in a parallel passage in Luke, similar to what he said in Matthew 10, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now again, one fear cures the other. Are you afraid of what's going to cost you to follow Jesus Christ? Well, you might be concerned about it, but you should be much more concerned about what it's going to cost you if you don't follow Jesus Christ. To be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. You are an enemy of God right now if you have not trusted Jesus Christ. And I'm appealing to all of us here. It doesn't matter whether you've made profession of faith or not. I mean, you may have done so falsely. If you do not know Jesus Christ, if you are not trusting him. You are still a friend of the world and an enemy of God. Let me put it this way. If you are still a friend of the world, still embracing the world and the things of the world, you are not a friend of God, but his enemy. You need to fear God rather than men because he can do much more to you than any man could ever possibly do. Well, that brings us to the third point, which is, of course, the point behind all of this. How can you live without fear? Which is something I hope we all want to do. Well, realize that there are two paths, and each path has things on it that will make you afraid. You have to decide which to choose, because there's only two. And again, you're already on one. You come on that path by default as you come into the world. If you haven't trusted Jesus, if you're not following Jesus, if you're not repenting of your sins, you are on the broad path of destruction. And if you choose to stay on that path, then there is nothing you can do to get rid of that fear because you should be afraid of what is ahead of you. The Bible says without any ambiguity, if you die on that path, if you die an enemy of God, he will condemn you to hell. You will be there immediately when you die and you will suffer for the rest of of eternity. God may actually even make you suffer in this life. Well, again, we often think about God is the, the benevolent God, and he is certainly so. And he gives good gifts all the time. He blesses everyone with everything that they have. But you know what? God is not bound to do that. There's nothing that forces him to do that. And there are times when God actually does take away blessings that he gives to unbelievers in this world. As a matter of fact, we read in Romans chapter 1 that God is pouring out his wrath every day against 
the wicked who know he exists and everybody knows he exists, but who are unwilling to thank him, but instead worship themselves, worship other things, worship idols, or they make idols of just about everything. God may in this life choose at any time to take away your comforts, your provisions, your health. He may even take away your life. And he can do that justly. By the way, if you want a very poignant sermon on that particular point, read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If that doesn't wake you up, I'm afraid nothing may do so. God can take away those things. He can take away your life at any point. And you can drop into hell. God's the only one who's actually stopping that from happening right now. But he may choose at any time to let go and let you fall. And he can do that, as I said, because he doesn't owe you any good thing. You have already forfeited all of his love and all of his kindness by your sins. You are his enemies if you haven't turned to Jesus Christ. If you stay on the broad path to destruction that he hates, he will destroy you. And if that doesn't make you afraid, then I pray that someday God will open your eyes to see while there is still time to do something about it. The only way to get rid of that fear, if your eyes are open this morning, is by walking on the other path, which you might have been afraid to walk on, but I hope you're not quite as afraid of it now as you were because of the, what's on the other path, the narrow path that leads to life. You can get rid of that fear if you trust Jesus Christ to save you. Turn from your sins and follow him. Now, again, you might say that you thought I just said that if you follow Jesus Christ, there are things that you are going to be afraid of. I mean, the loss of family members and friends, the possibility of suffering and even dying. How can you walk on that path and not be afraid? I mean, look at the disciples. Weren't they afraid? Well, sadly, you know, the disciples were, weren't they? But did they have to be afraid? Actually, Jesus told them over and over again, do not be afraid, didn't he? And I, that's a command. They should have obeyed that command, but they didn't. Perhaps they didn't yet know how to apprehend what the Lord had for them. They were looking at Jesus walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. How can Jesus be so fearless, especially since he's going to Jerusalem, knowing what is waiting for him there, and he's out in front leading us. I mean, how can this be? Why isn't he afraid? Was Jesus afraid? You know, we have to be a little bit careful here because we know that Jesus had some concern for his well-being. I mean, he didn't enjoy pain. When he was in the garden thinking about the agony that he was going to go through of suffering crucifixion and his father's wrath on the cross, Jesus prayed. And he says, Father, if it's possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. I think Jesus was concerned. I don't think he looked forward to the pain that was ahead of him. But there were other things, other considerations, other things that he desired more that overrode the pain that he might have to endure for doing them. I mean, Jesus knew the reason he came into the world and that it was going to be accomplished in Jerusalem that there he would save his people. Having uh, lived a life that was pleasing to his father in every way, he was prepared to die on the cross for them, to pay for their sins, for, for everyone who would put their trust in him. He knew that all of that that he was looking forward to, as well as all the hatred he had already endured from his people, that it all had a purpose. And that purpose was he would restore his father's honor and he would redeem his people. He knew that there was a reward ahead of him for the work he was about to do, that the father had promised to give him honor and glory and majesty. He had promised actually to seat him above all authority on earth and give him the name that was above every name. And he knew that he would have that honor and glory from his father for all eternity. And he knew, of course, when he went through this difficulty that his father was going to be with him to help him finish everything that he had to do, that his father would not leave him. And even when Jesus was on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Jesus knew that the Father had turned away, as it were, because he had become the sin bearer and God's curse was falling upon him, but he also knew that the hand that was striking him was a hand that loved him. He knew his father had not ultimately forsaken him, but he knew that he was becoming a curse for the sins that he was bearing. He was becoming a curse for those who would trust in him so that they would not have to be cursed and endure God's wrath for all eternity. Jesus could go through these things because he knew why he was doing it. He knew what he was going to receive for doing it. He knew he was doing these things to repair the Father's honor whom he loved so much. Now that is why Jesus was able to do this. And let me suggest to you that you can do exactly the same thing if you will simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though the disciples were having some difficulty at this point in their lives, doesn't mean that it continued. Remember that Peter who denies three times that Jesus Christ even knows him, and that, I think, a couple of times in front of a servant girl, will shortly after that stand up before several thousand and proclaim that they crucified Jesus Christ and they need to repent. Peter overcame his fear, and you can as well, if you will trust Jesus. First of all, you need to trust him to save you of your sins. He is the only one who can take away your sins. The Bible says if you will trust him to do that, he will do that. You, you can overcome your fear by following the Lord Jesus as well. Because in following Jesus Christ, being one of his children, there are certain things that you can know, certain things that you know to be true about yourself that you can't know if you don't trust him. For one thing, you can know the reason why you exist. You can know what your purpose is in, is in life, and that is to follow Jesus, to be his disciple, to love him and to serve him no matter what he calls you to do. You can know, like Jesus Christ, that there is a reward waiting for you in heaven, that the Lord will bless you for every sacrifice you make, for every difficulty that you have to endure, for every time you suffer or are threatened or are hated by others. You know, Paul actually gloried in the fact that he was hated for Christ. He actually rejoiced in the fact that he was beaten with rods, that he was stoned, stoned in the sense that they threw rocks at him and so forth, and actually thought they had killed him. He rejoiced in the fact that he was shipwrecked and that he spent several days out in the wilderness because of that. Why would a person rejoice in the very sufferings that you and I were afraid of? because he knew that he was doing it in the place of Jesus Christ because he loved him. And he was willing to do that because of what Jesus endured for him. He was willing to do that because he knew that he was storing up treasures in heaven and that God would honor him forever for those sacrifices that he had made. He was willing to do that. And he was also, of course, willing to do that because he knew that the Lord was with him. God was giving him strength to do this. He knew that he would help him in everything that he did. And by the way, you can know that too. If you trust Jesus Christ, turn from your sins and follow him, that he will be with you even as he was with Jesus Christ to complete what it is he calls you to do so that when you do have to face the hatred of others, you don't have to face it alone. Jesus said to his disciples when he told them to go out and make disciples of the world, he says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So how can you do these things and not be afraid? Well, again, it's because of these things. You can know that there's a purpose behind it. You can know there's a reward for it. You can know that Jesus is going to be with you, going through these things with you and helping you. You can do it because you love the Lord and you're willing to stand in his place and take that abuse that was meant for him and even consider it an honor to do that. So that even if you have to give up these other things that the Lord says that you may have to give up, family members, friends, possessions, you can also have the promise that the Lord made when we looked at it a couple weeks ago, that he will not, well, that basically he will give you many more times as much as anything you have to give up. If you have to give up friends, he'll give you more friends. 
If you have to give up family members, he'll give you a larger family. If you have to give up possessions, you will have access to much more. Jesus made that promise. And even if you have to suffer or die for Jesus Christ, that he will be with you and that he will receive you into heaven when all that is over. I told you earlier that for the Christian, death is simply a doorway to heaven. Paul actually wanted death to come to him when he was in prison so that he might actually be with the Lord instead of just being on earth while the Lord was in heaven. He knew that to be there was very much better. The thing we fear the most is death. And yet for the Christian, it is the greatest blessing. God takes away through his son, Jesus Christ, the sting of death, the fear of death. And if you're not afraid of that, you really have nothing more to be afraid of. The Lord will take it away. Now, we do need to admit at the same time, it's true that you're never going to be completely free from fear. You're always going to have to struggle with it because as the disciples, you are not perfect yet. They did not yet have a perfect love and trust of the Lord Jesus Christ, which if they did would take away their fear. But we can certainly say this, that these things will go a long ways in helping you get the courage you need to follow Jesus as the Spirit of God applies his word savingly to your heart. Now, this is what the Lord says he is willing to do for you. He will take away your fear of the things you will have to face on the right path and certainly <clears throat> the things you have to be afraid of being on the wrong path. He'll take away all of that fear if you will simply trust in his son, Jesus Christ. And I mean more than just believe the facts. I mean, the devils believe the facts. There's lots of people everywhere throughout the world who believe that what the Bible says is true. They believe those facts. They believe Jesus existed. He died on the cross and so forth. And they may even believe that he is the son of God and this is the only way of salvation. But they are not saved any more than those who are already condemned to hell who believe are saved. They believe those things are true too, you know. But it doesn't save them. And there are many demons in the world. The Bible says, James tells us, they believe and they tremble. But they're not saved because you need to do more than just believe the facts are true. You actually need to look to Jesus Christ and trust him for your salvation to take away your sins. Trust his death on the cross as the atonement that takes away your sins that makes you right with God. Trust in his obedience, his works, to make you righteous before God. I mean, he says, he basically says, I stand here ready to give it to you. And I will give it to you if you just look to me and trust me to do it. So what you need to do is you need to look to him and trust him. Jesus, you said that all who come to you, you will take away their sins and you will give them a perfect righteousness. I come to you now and trust you for that. That's what you need to do. And you need to as well turn away from your sins and begin to follow him. If you truly trust in Jesus, that is what you will do. So the bottom line is this. If you don't come to Jesus, you have every reason to be afraid for your life at every moment. Because God can, with perfect justice, take away your life and cast you into hell. But if you come to him through Jesus Christ and trust in him, he will free you from all fear. Fear of hell, fear of what man can do to you, fear of going without, fear of whatever you might be afraid of, he will take it away. And you can basically have the same kind of courage that Jesus Christ had when he led the disciples to Jerusalem knowing what he was going to go through. If you want to be free from fear, trust in Jesus. I hope that you will come to him and be safe. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard to, to our lives in particular. And if you, again, I would encourage you, if you haven't trusted Jesus, look to him now. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to pray any particular prayer. You just simply need 
to look to him by faith and trust his promise. He will do what he has said he will do if you will just simply trust him. Let's bow for a moment of prayer.